Well, it's great to be back with you. And uh, listen, uh, it's so, so cool. We, we started off in, in Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. We were talking about the Great Commission. And uh, we uh, took some time and last week and we talked about the authority that is given to us because of who Jesus is. And I kind of brought a relationship between uh, football and what I was sharing and how uh, on the football field, there's two teams going, but there's an official uh, team that, that's on the field, and they're basically uh, they get their authority from the uh, the commission that is over them and uh, the commissioner and the league, and just kind of related that. So uh, we we got to that point, but we find in Matthew uh, it goes on to say that we are all called to be disciples and to disciple those around us. The Great Commission really wasn't um, a kind of a choice. When Jesus shares it, and you look at the scripture verses there, it literally is a command. You are called to make disciples. And the craziest thing out of this is the purpose of the church and each individual believer is that we're called to make disciples. And it's not just the pastor. For whatever reason, somewhere in time, all of a sudden, the churches have shifted and feel that the pastor is responsible to do all the training up and, and all the discipleship of people that get saved. But that's not the truth of what Scripture is saying. It's not what Jesus has called us to. It's not just the pastors. It's every one of us. It's not enough to have a church open every Sunday or a Bible study every week, and running great programs, we are called to make disciples. So what is a disciple? So I wrote down a few things here. What a disciple is. It is a man or a woman who is consistently operating under the rule of Jesus in their life, or his character in their life. A, a disciple is not merely a person that has just accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as great as that is, and is just waiting to get to heaven. A disciple is one where heaven directs every direction of them why they live on earth. They are in tune with Jesus and follow his commandments and his, and his direction and, and has the Holy Spirit directs you to walk. A disciple is one taught it, it means literally in the dictionary, a learner or a student. A, a Christian, uh, for a Christian, discipleship involves an apprenticeship. And I can really relate to this because I was an apprentice before I went into the ministry. And in fact, many pastors are like uh, under an apprenticeship if they're under a lead pastor. And uh, very unique, like when I was in the trade, I had a journeyman. Instead of, you know, being under our master, disciples, disciples in Jesus' day were just like their master. If you saw them, they would have all the characteristics of their master. For me, when I was in the trade as a refrigeration mechanic, I had a journeyman. And if you had that same journeyman for the four years of your apprenticeship, you know, a lot of times you would you would fix things the same way he did. You would have the same way of figuring out what was broken and how to fix it and how to do all those things. And that same type of outlook sometimes will even happen with a pastor. If you have a young pastor that's under a lead pastor, he'll pick up all his ways of doing ministry, and it's almost like you have a clone of the other guy. And that's what discipleship is. A disciple is one who is trained and nurtured to be like Jesus. Being transformed into the image of Jesus and the likeness of his character, his love, his compassion, uh, how he conducts himself around people. It's kind of in the same way if we get back to the football analogy, uh, we see the same thing. The official doesn't exist, exist uh, for his popularity or his cause. He makes his rules based on the rules and the authority of those that are above him. And in fact, when you see the official, whatever he does is really what the league or what the commissioner and the owners have already put into place. So we are called 
to live our lives on earth as Jesus lived his life on earth, but most of all, how he's living his life in heaven. We are called to reflect Jesus Christ. And what God is looking for is for us to raise up copies of him so that people would truly get an opportunity to see what Jesus is like. We need to understand, if we go on in verse 19 and verse 20, Jesus starts to uh, unfold some of the things of being a disciple. And the first one we want to look at out of these three words, he say, and this is what he says. He says in these verses, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So out of those verses, we can grab three key areas that we want to talk about. One is go. Listen, I did a deep theological study on go. I know you're saying, you did a deep theological study, Pastor Steve. Yes, I did. I did a deep theological study on that word go. And guess what that word go means? It means go. That's what it means. It means go. It literally means go. The first aspect of making disciples is to go out to the non-Christians in your community. See, Christ has commanded us to make disciples. He wants us to impact our community. He doesn't want us to just uh, be residents uh, of our neighborhood. He doesn't want us just to be a part of our church. He wants us to impact our communities for the kingdom of God. We are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I, I, heard, I heard this and I, and I wrote this down because I think it's so important. God commands us uh, to be proactive not sitting back waiting for people to come. It's, it's often not enough to sit back in your church and wait till people start coming to church. God has made us proactive to go out to where they are and, and speak into their lives and show Christ. And that doesn't mean you have to preach at them. Just show Christ, care for them, help them out, speak to them. Accepting those who may from time to time come into our church is great. But we need to go where they are. So we need to take that initiative. Make the first step. Start being a part of this great commission. When you see someone sitting uh, in church on Sunday, and you know they're new to the church, make the initiative to go and say hi to them. Don't wait for them to come and see you. You see somebody that's new to the church, help them out to find where they need to go and what they need to do. You need to take the initiative. Don't just sit back and say, hey, come to me. You need to make the, the first step towards them. That's what Jesus was talking about when he says go. But the same thing is with those people that you're around in your community. Uh, you get a brand new person, moves into your neighborhood. You be the first to go over and bring them some cookies or something like that and say, welcome to our neighborhood. You need to be the one when you see somebody stuck in their driveway, give them a shove. We're coming into that season. It's coming. Or maybe you got the snowblower out. Go blow out their driveway and, and do something like that. Take the initiative to start doing this. We are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we call that, uh, if we give it a title, it's called evangelism. You are only limited by your imagination how you can evangelize. You can evangelize at school, evangelize at home, you can evangelize in your hobbies, even in the, the, the social groups that you have, your exercise group, your swimming group. God will use you whenever you're available to him. Sticking with the football theme, it's kind of like the church is like a huddle. You know, in football, if you're not into football, they, after every play, they come back and, and the referee puts the ball on the ground. They huddle up. All the, the, the team gets into a complete huddle. It's a circle usually or a couple lines. And the quarterback tells them what the next play is going to be. It tells them what the hike is going to be, like what number are they going to come off on the ball. They're also told what the play is, and if they're going through a certain gap, that's where they're going. And so those linemen know to open up that gap so the running back can run through it. So all of this is being shared in the huddle, 
right? So this is where all the communication, all the directions are going, and everything is happening in this huddle. We need to agree with each other that the church is kind of like a huddle. We get along. Those guys in the huddle, they're the same team. They get along. They're all listening because they want to know the direction, but they all want to work together. The church is kind of that way. When we're in church, we're not really battling the other team in church. We're Hopefully, we're all getting along, and, and we're working to hear what God wants to do or praising God for what He's done. The battle's outside of the church. And can I share this with you? If I have paid the big bucks to go to Lambeau Field and watch the Green Bay Packers play, I am not excited about them being in a huddle the whole game. I don't want to see these guys all huddled up talking. I want to see them come out of the huddle and I want to see them score. And I really believe that's a little bit about the angels in heaven and Jesus is saying, I don't want to just see my church family huddled up in the church. I want to see them get praise and worship and get their direction by the Holy Spirit and get built up in the church, but then get out of the church and go score. Find somebody to love on and somebody to lead towards the Lord. Isn't that true? I hope that's true for you. I hope that you've caught that. The world wants to see what we are going to do when we come out of the huddle. They don't want to just know, well, hey, they go to church. They want to know what, what changed you, what, what happened when you were in church, not just huddling up in here. Jesus is calling us to be a visible example and a verbal example of who he is to the world. Number two, baptize. Wow, are you ready for this one? We just had a baptismal service. What an awesome time. After we go, the next part of making disciples is baptizing people who have accepted Jesus Christ. See, the point of baptism isn't get, merely getting somebody wet. The point is that it's a public declaration of their identity. See, uh, we need to understand the primary meaning of that Greek word Baptism is identification. That's what it means. And to baptize them into their identification of Jesus. So when we're baptizing somebody in water, what we're doing is we're baptizing them that they have had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and now they're identifying themselves that they're a child of God. It is not an identity of a church or a fellowship. It's an identity that I am a child of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're sitting there right now listening to me and you've never been water baptized. I hope this stirs you up because we're going to have another one because we get just so many new people coming in and I think we're going to have a lot of people that want to get water baptized again. So understand this. It's not merely getting wet as much as I like putting you under the water. The reality that comes with it, it's, it's showing the public, it's showing your family, it's showing the church family that literally I identify myself with Jesus Christ. When you see me, you should see Jesus and what he's changing in my life. Baptismal is, is a word that comes out uh, of baptism, and, and that word was used by in Jesus' day by those that dyed clothes or dye makers. They would dye material. So if a woman wanted to have a uh, blue dress for their daughter or for the christening or whatever was going on at that time, or, or their dedication, they would take this white material that they had, and they would take it to the dye maker, and he would change the color of it to whatever color they wanted. So the picture that we get in the New Testament is of dipping of a cloth in dye so that the cloth becomes completely identified with the color of the dye. So take this, they would have a cloth and the dye would be blue and this cloth was white. They would put the cloth down into the dye. When they brought it up, now the cloth is identified with the dye. You would say that's a blue cloth because of the blue dye. And then what they would do is hang it out to dry, let it drip, and when it dried, then they would give it back to the, that individual and it would be the same color as what the dye was. 
It was always the same cloth, right? Get this. It was always, the cloth didn't change going into the dye. Its identity, its appearance changed. And so it is with us when we are baptized, we go down into the water and we come out different. We're transformed. There's something that happens. We're still the same person, but we have now taken on the identity of him. And not only have we taken on the identity of him, but we have taken on his death and resurrection. Hallelujah, that is so cool. Paul says in Romans 6, 3 to 4, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may live a new life. That's why we uh, at our church and many other churches do total immersion. We take you right down like you're going into that dye and coming up afresh and anew. We don't just sprinkle. Like I, I got sprinkled on when I was in the United Church. But this is, is a time, that's why we don't do it with just little children that don't know that they've accepted Jesus Christ into their lives. It's an identity saying this is where I am. You look one way when you're going under the water, and you look a different way when you're coming out. You need to talk to some of these people that have been water baptized. I don't understand it, but they said their lives was changed. They felt something different when they came up out of the water. It's just straight well water from out in the valley, but it has an anointing on it of obedience. Jesus is your new identity. He is a part of it, and he's paid a price for you, and your identity is there. I want you to understand this. You're bought by a price. You're not just a doctor. If I'm talking to somebody that's a doctor right now, you're, you're not just a doctor. You're God's represent, representative to the medical field. If you're a teacher, you're not just a teacher. You're God's representative to that school that you're teaching in. If you're a tradesman, you're not just a tradesman. You're, you're God's representation to wherever you're working, in the mine, on surface, wherever you are. If you're a housewife that's at home or, or a dad that's staying home to raise the kids, you are not just a parent. You are not just a fa overseeing your family. You literally are a representative to your family. You are to identify to him. Lastly, teach. The last step in this process of making disciples is teaching others. After people have believed the gospel and been identified, they've said, hey, I'm a child of God, we must teach them, verse 20 says, to obey God's word in Matthew. So, through the combination of information and knowledge with skill in applying the truth to our daily lives. That's what God is calling us to do. See, uh, if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Mark chapter 8, there's a couple of things I want to just show you real quickly in Mark chapter 8. After Jesus taught uh, the people and fed the 5,000, remember the feeding of the 5,000? little boy had his luncheon. Jesus asked if he'd give his lunch up, or the disciples did, and he multiplied the loaves and the fishes in Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. Jesus turns around, and immediately after doing this, and in fact, catch this, Jesus taught on this. The disciples came and said, we don't have enough food. Jesus turns around and tells them, go find some food. Don't send the people away. And he turns around and he breaks the bread, but he has them to take the bread to each person and the loaves and fishes, like the fish as well, to each of the people. The disciples did it. They saw the miracle happening at their hands, in their hands. They saw the miracle happening. And we see Jesus says this, Immediately, he had his disciples get into a boat after, in verse 10, and head out. And according to verse 14 uh, and 21, Jesus wanted his disciples to apply the lesson they had learned by watching him and the power to meet the needs that they had. Here they are, they're in the boat, and, and we read in, in verse 14, it goes on, and in fact, let's, let's look at verse 17. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? 
They just saw him multiply a loaf to feed 5,000 plus people. And they're worried about not having enough bread in the boat. Do you still not understand? Are your, uh, are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears fail to hear? And don't you understand when I break the five loaves and, and, and fed the five thousands, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? In fact, they fed everybody and still had loaves left. Unbelievable. And they come back, the 12, they replied, and when I broke the seven loaves, Jesus said, and the four, four, uh, the 5,000, how many baskets were left? And then they, the seven answered. They answered, seven baskets were, were left behind after feeding everybody. And, and Jesus says this, do you still not understand? Have you not caught that I will provide everything you need? Have you not caught what I just taught you? And that's why Jesus was saying, young Christians are going to have questions and they're going to need somebody to mentor them. And you may think, I don't have the answers, but the Holy Spirit will help you and do that for you. Information without application keeps you from having transformation. I need you to hear that again. Information without application keeps you from having transformation. It's not enough to just hear the truth. It's not enough to agree with the truth until you act on the truth that you have heard. Making a disciple is not uh, an academic uh, exercise. It is an interactive of our life. And, and we need to do that. Do you not know what God wants to do, he's going to give you the direction. He's going to help you. Jesus is going to give you the words. But we are called to not just see somebody get saved, but we're called to work with them. Get them in the Bible. Get them into a life group. Mentor them. Be there for their questions and their answers that they have. And I love verse 20 of Matthew because it says this, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're not alone in this. The Holy Spirit is there to help us. So let me bring this to a conclusion. How many of you remember Superman? I mean, he's still on TV. There's still movies about Superman. He's a part of the, all these superheroes. Well, Superman, he was Clark Kent. Uh, he was this, this uh, socially struggling guy, had his glasses and all this stuff. And his boss barely used him in the reporting in the newspaper uh, area. And many times overlooked him for the big, the big uh, news articles and stuff that he needed to do. But can I say this? Uh, don't let him find a telephone booth. Because if Clark Kent found a telephone, telephone booth, there was a transformation that happened in him. Remember the show, the criminals would show up and they would start causing havoc and stealing women's purses and robbing banks and everything. And all of a sudden the people would be found shouting out, where is Superman? Well, he would take his glasses off, he would unclip his, his tie, he would go into a telephone booth, and before you know it, he would be transformed, and he would come out in his, in, in his red suit with his cape, and he would go into battle. He was faster than a speeding bullet. He was able to leap over tall buildings in a single bound. Look up in the sky. It's, it's a bird, right? It's a plane. No, it's Superman. Oh my goodness. He brought order to the town that he was in. And the reason he could bring order to the town was he was not from that town. He was from Krypton. He brought the power of where he came and he used that power to bring peace, love, safety, freedom, he, he lived it out down on earth, what he had where he used to live. He was from up there, functioning down here to transform what was happening down here. Kind of sounds like us, we are carrying the authority of heaven on earth to transform what's happening on earth 
God is looking for some Christians that will go into a telephone booth and will come out with an S on your shirt. Now, nah, you know, I'm kidding a bit here. But that S doesn't mean you're a superman. It means that you are saved and you have a commission and you are called to make disciples of those around you. You are called to go. You are called to baptize. You are called to teach. See, when you walk out of your house, when you walk out of your church, when you walk out of wherever you are, will they say, is it a bird? No. Is it a plane? No. Is it a, those super Christians from Valley Pentecostal Church? Yes. That's what we are, representing Jesus Christ. And we're not in this alone. So today, find a telephone booth. Come out changed. You're not the same. Take the initiative. Know that God is with you and God wants you to love on the people around you in our community. Thank you. God bless you.